Uh, since last time we talked, Kyle, that we didn't have like the deferments. We didn't know what exactly the Dodgers next steps were going to be. But since that time, Tyler Glass now coming to Los Angeles, Yamamoto coming to Los Angeles, Shohei Itani leaving $690 million to be paid out in 10 years at the end of his deal. Uh, what do you make of some of the moves the Dodgers have made since then? And how do you think it's going to pay off for them? Well, the Dodgers went into the offseason attempting to rebuild a starting rotation from scratch. And in fairness, Shohei Otani by itself doesn't repair a starting rotation from scratch. I mean, we know he's having Tommy John surgery. We don't know what that's going to look like coming back. I think it would be awesome to see him transition into like a hybrid three inning reliever role late in games. But maybe he's still in the starting pitching mindset. But then the Dodgers came out and they traded for a former Cy Young finalist and handed out the largest contract to a pitcher in the history of Major League Baseball, which I thought was interesting that Yamamoto signed for $1 million more than what Garrett Cole signed for when he got his big free agent contract with the Yankees. Obviously, it's over 12 years, so the average annual value is lower, but the Dodgers essentially got themselves a Game 2 and Game 3 starter locked in their back pocket going forward and I've never seen Yamamoto pitch but I trust that 325 million dollars and the fact that there were four teams who were ready to offer him 300 million dollars or more suggests that he is the real deal and that he'll fit somewhere into this rotation for the Dodgers both of those are great moves adding Manuel Margot in the trade also from Tampa is a nice pickup because he'll be able to kind of hybrid with James Outman in the outfield and having another name in that lineup is going to be helpful for them because you do get into the seven, eight, and nine, and like with most teams, it's kind of a, uh, I'm not so sure about Jason Hayward or James Outman or some of the guys deeper in that lineup. So adding that little depth piece is nice for the Dodgers. And each of those three moves by themselves is an excellent, excellent move by the Dodgers. And when you put all three of them together, they have definitely improved their roster and all they had to give up was money. And a couple prospects hurt them as much to lose as compared to some of the prospects they've traded away in deals for Trey Turner or Max Scherzer or guys in the past. I, I think they're feeling pretty good about the state of affairs right now. Does it change anything at all for you when I contextualize it with like Glass now, he's never pitched over 150 innings or Yamamoto, like power guy, small body. We've seen those guys burn out in four to five years, and this is a over a decade long deal. And then, of course, Shohei himself coming off a of second Tommy John, he might just be the hitter version of Shohei, which is still excellent, but you're paying him seven hundred million. When I say those three things out loud, does that change at all the perception of these deals? Well, technically, according to the competitive balance tax, you're only paying Shohei Otani forty six million per year over the next 10 years, which makes things a little bit sweeter when you look at those contract deferments. And by the way, I know it's 46 million against the competitive balance tax, but 44 million of that is just because of whatever math the Major League Baseball Players Association and collective bargaining agreement makes to say that it's 46 million. I mean, that's $44 million in cash that they are pocketing after this whole deal, which in reality, because the Dodgers are paying potentially 250 or 300 percent on luxury taxes that 44 million dollars in cash actually looks like 120 or 150 million dollars in cash that the Dodgers are holding on to because of that deal so they can afford to make mistakes this is the the key difference between the what I call the haves and the have-nots in baseball is that you can afford to make a mistake if you are a top payroll team. I'll never forget the 2018 Red Sox, who were the best team maybe in the history of baseball, most dominant team, straight up cut Hanley Ramirez and took a $27 million penalty at the beginning of that season. They just said, sorry, we don't need you anymore. Goodbye. Take the losses and still put together maybe the most dominant team baseball has seen this century. So you have room to make mistakes if you're the Dodgers. And the thing that makes their life so much easier is those deferred payments, because even if it's only saving $24 million a year against the competitive balance tax, which is not an insignificant amount of money, obviously, $24 million a year is not an insignificant amount of money. But if you're saving that $24 million a year against the competitive balance tax, 
you can afford to make more mistakes, which Lord knows the Dodgers have made some mistakes in the past <laughs> when it comes to their pitching staff. If Glasnow's arm never recovers or Yamamoto reaches year four and he's not the player that he was when he was playing in Japan, well, the Dodgers will have to reevaluate then. But the Dodgers for the last four years have missed on basically every pitcher they have tried to bring into that organization. So we'll see if this adds to a long line of Dodger mishaps or if these are the pitchers who along with Otani will anchor their rotation for years to come. Is it designed to work out this year? Obviously, like you mentioned, like Shohei's not coming in at full strength as the Dodgers are hoping he will down the line. But if it doesn't work this year, given the type of pressure that's going to be on the season, uh, what do you think would have to change in that instance? Do you think that would be the finally the straw that broke the camel's back with someone like Dave Roberts? That's interesting to think about because I would want to know how we got there because if it's injuries again, you know, it adds to the long line of just awful luck for the Dodgers with injuries. And obviously we can, we can take the injury cases with like Scherzer coming over in 2021 and then not being able to pitch in the NLCS. We could talk about Bueller, Tommy John, Dustin May, Tommy John, Gonsolin, Tommy John. And we can put those in one category. And then we can also put in another category, Trevor Bauer and Julio Arias, both of whom will never pitch again in Major League Baseball for reasons that are not injury related. So we can kind of take both of those in separate contexts while also acknowledging the Dodgers have had some issues on the pitching staff. And I don't know which of that falls on Dave Roberts. I know some of the concerns with him have been taking starters out too early. People can attribute some of his management of pitchers to injuries as it relates to some of these guys, but I'm not quite sure where the sword will fall on Dave Roberts right now. We'll just kind of see how the season plays along. And in terms of like getting the pitching staff set for the future, I mean, so Bueller's not going to come back until at the very earliest late this season. They don't suspect Gonsolin will be back until probably 2025. Obviously, Otani won't be back until 2025. They should get Dustin May back at some point, but Dustin May was at best a two or a three starter before he had the Tommy John surgery. So we'll see what ends up happening with his career. I'm just really interested to see where where they build out the rest of that rotation for this year. Because you're right, three of their top end starters are not coming back right now. The thing that would put all of this in question also is what is going to happen with Clayton Kershaw? Nobody really knows where Kershaw falls into this equation because he probably won't be back until May or June at the earliest. He's obviously a free agent right now. They'd love to have him back on a one-year contract, but does Kershaw want some more long-term security from a deal? This is probably the last paycheck that he's going to get. So Kershaw puts the whole thing in loop also. So more than like, does the sword fall on Dave Roberts? I'm not necessarily sure yet because I don't know how the rotation's going to fall. The thing that's way more interesting, I think, is what is going to happen with Clayton Kershaw. Because has Kershaw earned the right to choose how he ends his career with the Dodgers as somehow being the greatest pitcher in that organization's history? And yes, I'm including Sandy Koufax. Like, how do you factor Kershaw and his injuries and the end of his career into the new rotation that they're building? Do you think uh, other MLB fans should have sour grapes about the deferments and how that worked out? And do you think that's a strategy that we'll start to see more often or moving forward? Or do you think the show is just a special case? In terms of baseball fans being salty, buddy, this is this is the the Star Wars Empire striking back, man. The, the, you thought the Empire was down. You thought the Empire was trying to be cheap by getting rid of Trey Turner and getting rid of Cody Bellinger. You thought the Empire was going to lay down when the the San Diego resistance came in and beat their 111 win death star. You thought they were going to lay down when the diamondbacks came in and smoked them out the playoffs. No, nah, man, this is the empire striking back. Sorry guys. The Dodgers are still the Dodgers. They are not afraid of you because they have infinite resources to which they can expand across the galaxy and destroy everything that they choose to see in their wake, at least until they get to the playoffs and probably lose to like Colorado or something like that. But still, the Dodgers are striking back. This is the game they play, man. It's the haves and the have nots of baseball. Uh, I don't think people should be upset over the deferments in terms of it being a, a trend or a one off. This is definitely a one off type of situation. One, because the players union isn't thrilled about the giant deferments. And when the new collective bargaining agreement comes up, they they're probably going to put caps on the deferments just to protect 
current people in the I mean it's interesting because like current people get more money but then the Dodgers are also maybe even owners will be upset about the deferments because of the competitive balance stuff I suspect they'll put in caps collectively bargained on deferred payments Uh, but the reason this is a one-off case is because Shohei Otani in endorsements makes like 300 percent more money than any other baseball player he can afford to defer this money because he is in essence, his own economy with or without the Los Angeles Dodgers. Yes, baseball is his primary form of income because he's guaranteed $700 million from the Dodgers, but it's not his primary income in the present. And so I understand the deferments. It, it means that the $700 million won't quite be worth $700 million when he actually collects it because of the value of the dollar going down and uh, you know, he might live somewhere else. So different tax rates and stuff like that. I, I don't know exactly how much it's going to be, but that also might have factored into the Dodgers willingness to pay him nearly twice the amount of money of the next highest paid player in baseball is the fact that 700 million 10 years from now might not be worth what 700 million is. Yeah, today. I have a bit of a question with that. Let's say five years down the line, this still isn't working out for whatever reason could be anything. If they trade Shohei Otani with the deferments, does the other team take on all those deferments or the Dodgers back pay half of that? I'm curious on how that would work out. They would probably have to negotiate it because Otani has a no trade clause and one of the most unique clauses that I've seen, which is that if the team sells or they fire Andrew Friedman, Otani can opt out of his contract, which is really (laughs) interesting to think about. But Well, yeah, that's crazy because of what we just literally talked about. Like, let's say this season is just a total bust for whatever reason. Who lands on the sword? You would think it probably wouldn't be Andrew Friedman, given that his future is intrinsically tied to Shohei Otani's future. This contract is so unique, and I assume the answer to your question is... Uh, there will be like a negotiation to determine who's paying what when Otani gets traded. Uh, this happened with Giancarlo Stanton getting traded from the Marlins to the Yankees, where part of the condition of the deal was that the Yankees took on like 80 some percent of the contract. Meanwhile, when Nolan Arenado got traded from the Rockies to the Cardinals, the Rockies were paying like a hundred million of his $230 million contract. And it's actually a bargain for Cardinals so much so that they gave Arenado a two-year extension on top of the contract he was already getting so I assume that it'll get negotiated by the two teams if and when Shohei Otani gets traded I assume because he's taking so little money now the future deferments are guaranteed so like if he opts out after five years because say Friedman got fired and Roberts got fired and they want to sell the team say he opts out after five years I assume that the $68 million in deferments for the next five years are already guaranteed by the Dodgers. So I assume they're already paying, you know, the $340 million in deferments for the first five years. And then maybe they'll negotiate down the final five years. But I just assume that when he plays this year, he will be guaranteed $68 million in deferments by the Dodgers. And then when he plays next year, he'll be de- another $68 million. That's what I assume the contract is. But assuming things to be correct in this Otani contract (laughs) are not the easiest thing to do, because obviously there are so many caveats and so many unique conditions, and and it's just such a unique contract. Not because this is the the direction that the future of baseball is going, because Shohei Otani is just that unique of a free agent signing and that unique of a valuable baseball player. (laughs) A true unicorn of the sport. Um, All right, guys. Well, what do you think of the moves the Dodgers have made in recent weeks? Do you think there's more moves to be made? God, I hope not. (laughs) Leave a like on the video. Subscribe to our channel. Follow us on all our social medias from Juju and Kyle. We'll see you next time.